The Magic Bicycle Chapter 7 The Offer of a Trade Nothing makes any sense anymore, John thought as he pushed the old red bike. He looked back, feeling he was being watched. Each time he looked, he saw nothing unusual, only the road, the weeds, and pieces of trash. The old bike seemed extra heavy because the day was hot. John was angry all over again at his uncle, at Barry, at Horace Grinsby, and especially at the Spirit Flyer. He felt as if the old red bike had betrayed him by not flying. At the same time, he felt he should be thankful to the Spirit Flyer because it saved him from the snake. John didn't know what to think. Nothing made sense. How could a bicycle fly? How could a skid mark turn into a snake? How could a tornado turn into a snake? And what about the time when the spirit flyer jumped out of the way of the lightning? Why did the bike stop flying and make him look like an idiot in front of Barry? John got angrier. Stupid bike, John muttered as he pushed. He looked back again. He thought he saw something move in the weeds. John stopped pushing and stared, searching for two red eyes or the black head of the snake. The snake scared John, but not just because it appeared from a skid mark. Though the skid mark snake didn't have the white circle X on its chest, it somehow seemed related to the snake in the dump and the tornado snake. And that's what scared John. It was bad enough to see a snake as big as a tornado, or a snake made out of a skid mark. But something deeper scared him, as if he were trying to remember a bad dream and couldn't. A dream about the snakes. The feeling made him uneasy, as if he were being watched, even in his dreams. Besides his fear, he felt disappointed. The bike wouldn't work. I won't be flying to the finish on this old junk heap bike, John thought bitterly, as he pushed the spirit flyer into the garage. John turned the bike upside down and began to work on the flat tire. He found a rag and wiped away the black, sticky substance that the snake bite had left. Then he took off the wheel. Even though he was in a bad mood, he was careful as he removed the inner tube. He didn't have enough money to buy a new one. John pumped up the inner tube to find the holes. He figured there would be two from the snake's fangs, but when he sank the tube into a tub of water, there were no bubbles. He checked everywhere. The tube was fine. John sighed at yet another puzzle and put the inner tube and tire back on. After he inflated the tire to the correct air pressure, he rode the old red bike out into the street for a test run. He only went a block before pushing down on the handlebars. As he expected, nothing happened. The spirit flyer continued to roll down the street like an ordinary bicycle. He rode back home and parked in the garage. Why don't you fly? he shouted at the old red bike. What have I done? It's not my fault, you stupid bike. What have you got against me? The old bike leaned against the wall. John almost expected it to answer him. It could certainly do other magic things by itself. Once again, John felt a surge of anger. He walked over to the old bike and kicked the wheel, bending three spokes. At the same instant, both tires made a shrill, hissing teapot noise and slowly went flat right before his eyes. I give up, John said. I wish I'd never found you. Even as he said the words, John knew he didn't really mean them. But angry people often say things they regret. John felt as if he should apologize, but that made him angry all over again. Why should he apologize to a bike, he thought. That's ridiculous. He stomped out of the garage, slamming the door behind him. John barely talked at supper that night. He thought his uncle would ask him about the fire at McCradle's farm, but his uncle was also unusually quiet. All John wanted was to finish supper and go to his room, but his plans were interrupted when the doorbell rang. Uncle Bill answered the door. John heard another man's voice, someone vaguely familiar. Then Uncle Bill called John. 
He left the table and was greeted by the happy face of Horace Grinsby. John, my boy, Grinsby said. How very nice to see you. How very nice. Hi, John mumbled, shaking Grinsby's limp hand. I can't tell you how sad, how very sad I was today when your uncle and I made the difficult decision of disqualifying you for the safety contest. Sure, John said. I bet you were sad, he thought. Therefore, in order to make up for your loss, I have a proposal for you, Grinsby grinned. Something I'm sure will excite you. What? One moment, please, Grinsby said. He went out the front door and returned, pushing a shiny new 10-speed bicycle into the room. The bike was metal flake black with lots of chrome. The seat was real leather. Somehow it looked familiar. Then John realized it was exactly like Barry Smedlow's bike. On the front was a picture of a black cobra rearing up with its mouth open. On the middle bar in gold letters was the name Goliath Cobra. As an agent of Goliath Toys, I am authorized to give you this bicycle, Grinsby said. This is our newest and best model. Quite costly, actually, but you have something my boss would like. What's that? John asked. He couldn't think of anything he owned that was really valuable. Your old red bicycle, Grinsby said. The one you found at the dump. I believe its brand name is Spirit Flyer. But why would your boss want it? John asked. Grinsby frowned for a second, then smiled once more. Well, it so happens that my boss has an antique bicycle collection, and your bike, a Spirit Flyer, though not a really good specimen of the Spirit Flyer line, is nonetheless a Spirit Flyer, Grinsby said. They are somewhat rare besides being old. Uncle Bill, who had been listening quietly, stared at Grinsby with more interest. Aunt Betty also looked puzzled. You've seen this type of bicycle before? Uncle Bill asked. Why, yes, of course, he said. Although they aren't too common, one sees them occasionally. John's cousin, Susan, Catherine, and Lois came into the room. When they saw the shiny new bicycle, they ran over to it, talking excitedly. What a pretty bicycle, Lois said. I don't know, Catherine replied. It almost seems mean. Look at that snake. It looks like it wants to bite you. Yeah, it does, sort of, Lotus said. Both girls stepped back. Nonsense, nonsense, Grinsby said, chuckling. <laughs> Children say the funniest things. Anyway, shall we take this out to the garage and get the spirit flyer? I can carry it in my truck. How did you know I found it at the dump? John asked. Something about Grinsby made him suspicious, though John couldn't decide what it was. Oh, some child told me, I think, Grinsby said. One hears things, you know. John thought for a moment. Everyone in the room was staring at him. Since the spirit flyer has stopped flying, maybe I should trade it, John thought. He was still mad at the old bicycle. But the idea of trading, even for a new bicycle, seemed impossible. No, I don't think so, John said. He was surprised to hear Aunt Betty sigh. When Uncle John looked at her, she had her hand over her mouth. Uncle Bill looked uneasy. Why are they acting so funny, John wondered. You mean you don't want to trade? Grinsby asked, as if he couldn't believe his ears. He looked angry for a moment, then smiled. This Goliath Cobra Deluxe is worth four times the price of the Spirit Flyer. I can see you drive a hard bargain. Good business sense, boy. So, to sweeten the deal, I will throw in a little money. I know my boss would like this bicycle. How does a thousand dollars sound to you, young man? Plus, the Goliath Cobra Deluxe. Everyone, including John, gasped as Grinsby took out his wallet and a fistful of dollars. Here, he said, handing John the money. One thousand dollars and the Goliath Cobra Deluxe. Now. Shall we load up the spirit flyer? I need to be going. John stared at the money. It was the most he had ever held in his hand. You can buy lots of nice things with that much money, young man, Grinsby said. You could even have enough left over to buy some pretty nice presents for these lovely young ladies here. 
even your aunt and uncle. Catherine and Lois jumped up and down and screamed in delight when they heard John might buy them a present. But Susan looked at John with fear in her eyes. We don't need presents, she said firmly, looking at Grinsby. Don't worry about us, John. Now, young lady, don't be so... No, John said suddenly. He gave the money back. I don't want to sell. Grinsby frowned for a long time, saying nothing. Very reluctantly, he put the money back in his wallet. Lois and Catherine looked sad. Susan smiled at John. Very well. I can see that you want to think it over, Grinsby said. No need to be hasty. If you want to change your mind, let me know. I will be around town. I bid you folks good night. Grinsby tipped his hat and pushed the black bicycle out the door. No one said anything until they heard his truck drive away. You must be crazy, John, Catherine said. A thousand dollars. That would be better than Christmas. Will you girls clean up the kitchen, please? Mrs. Kramer asked. I get to dry, screamed Lois. Me too, said Catherine. Susan has to wash. Susan was quiet. She walked over to John and hugged him. John was surprised. She ran out of the room without saying a word. We sit down, John, Uncle Bill asked. His voice was serious. He looked at his watch, then at Aunt Betty. John sat down. For some reason, he felt relieved, as if a great weight had been lifted off of his shoulders. But everything changed when he heard his uncle's next words. Lucy McCradle is coming over in just a few minutes, Uncle Bill said. I went out to her farm today. She wants to thank you. And we'll read chapter 8 in the next video. I hope you're enjoying the story. Please reach down, click like, subscribe to our channel, and leave a comment down below. We'd love to hear from you. I love you guys. And as Tigger says, ta-ta for now.